So our last session for this webinar is on sustainable landscape for wildlife. Juliet moved to Eugene, Oregon in September of 2012 and became a master gardener in April of 2013. Her yard, about a quarter acre suburban lot, is filled with trees, shrubs, and lots of flowers. She has dwarf apple, pear, and plum trees, blueberry shrubs, lots of perennials, and four raised beds for vegetables. Year round, she loves watching the many birds and pollinators which visit her yard. Juliet will talk about how you can create your own sustainable landscape for wildlife by planting native plants, creating pollinator habitats, as well as following other important practices. I'm pleased to introduce Juliet Bender. Thank you, Jan, for that presentation. And um, I'm glad to be here tonight. I wish I could see all of you, but unfortunately that's not the way it is. Uh, I don't have quite the uh, grand backdrop that uh, Joanne and Catherine had, but uh, you'll have to look at my gorgeous pictures instead on my PowerPoint. So tonight we're going to be talking about sustainable landscapes for wildlife. So what does that mean? What is sustainable landscapes for wildlife? It basically means that we practice good stewardship, uh, good environmental stewardship, and that we live in harmony and in tandem with wildlife. And I'm going to talk to you about how we can do that in, in our suburban lots. It, we don't have to have acres and acres in order to live with wildlife. So biodiversity, we want to protect that, and it is very important that we do that. And landscapes that have a broad range of plants, plant materials, and we'll talk about that throughout my speech, uh, will attract a lot of different insects, a lot of birds, and it will help to ensure that we have robust and resilient ecosystems, even in our own little lots that we have in, in suburban landscapes. So you can see a lot of these pictures here of uh, dragonflies, uh, ladybugs, all of these bees that you can attract to your individual yard just by knowing a few key principles about what to grow and what to have in your yard. This is a great quote um, by Doug Douglas Ptolemy. He wrote uh, a wonderful book called Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants. And this is a quote from him. And let me just read it. For the first time in its history, gardening has taken on a role that transcends the need of the gardener. Like it or not, gardeners have become important players in the management of the nation's wildlife. And it is very true that we cannot just rely on wildlife refuges, on national parks, but we as uh, people that live inhabitants of this earth have to take care in our own little acre or half acre or quarter acre, taking care of the wildlife that lives in our vicinity. I'm sure many of you have seen this web of life. Um, it's just very important to know that all living things depend on living and non-living matter to survive for food, for shelter, and it all begins uh, here at the bottom with the healthy soil. And you were hearing about how to improve your soil with compost just before this, with soil and with plants. That will help to feed all of these various creatures um, above in this, in this um, web of life. So what is happening in um, a lot of our areas is basically a loss of habitat. We're seeing a lot of urban development in areas where there had never been urban development before. That's obviously causing forests 
to trees to um, be toppled, uh, grasslands to disappear. So we're seeing a lot of changes to habitat. We're also seeing invasive species that are overpowering some of our natives. And that is starting to be a problem or continuing to be a problem. And of course, climate change. We hear a lot of talk about climate change and how that is um, changing our temperatures and changing um, the weather. And all of these things uh, cause a decline in our pollinator populations. And we are seeing that certainly over um, the last number of years. For example, the population of North American birds has dropped nearly 30% since 1970. That was a study done by Cornell University. And uh, since 1990, nearly 1 billion monarch butterflies have died, basically because of loss of habitat and pesticide use. So um, we're seeing with the urban development, with invasive species such as ivy and scotch broom um, are taking over um, places that used to have lots of wildlife. So loss of habitat is critical. Also um, lawns, a lot of us have large expanses of lawn, but is this the way we really want to um, have our property? Because this is really a monoculture that is limited, limited support for insects and, and pollinators. You really don't have anything here that a pollinator can use to have nectar or host plants. It's basically a monoculture. So we want to think about other ways of doing things and what might be better and why than just having the perfect lawn. So tonight we're gonna to talk about how to change your yard into a miniature wildlife refuge. Um, and I'm gonna talk about each of these ways uh, that you can do it and give you some examples and ideas as to how you might have that miniature wildlife refuge in your own backyard by planting native plants, by creating pollinator habitats, by providing water sources, by providing nesting materials, having food for um, pollinators for both summer and winter. Winter is especially critical for some of these um, populations, and also to think about reducing and eliminating pesticide use. So we will talk in more detail about each of these. But the goals are to um, think about how you might add more natives into your yard, uh, to think about removing any invasives that you have, and Observe what works and enhance what you already have. You don't have to do this all at once. It can be done over a period of time, years basically, especially if you're planting a wide variety of, of, um, of pollinator plants. But a lot of what you have in your yard might work and you just might need to tweak a few things. So you just need to think about what you have and what you might want to change and then make a plan as to how you can add um, to create that pollinator habitat. So all of us have different types of gardens. Some of us have more shade gardens because we have a lot of trees around our property. Some of us may have more woodland properties or maybe we have a lot of natives but we can work with all of these in order to create um, a sustainable landscape for wildlife in our own backyards. So this is a slide just to show you some easy ideas as to how to add things to your yard, such as here's a birdhouse or bird feeders or a hummingbird feeder. Um, a, a water source. 
some plantings, di diverse types of plantings. Um, here's a bat box, a bat house, something you can add. And this is just to let you know that um, cats can be a problem outside. So keeping a cat inside is probably a, a good idea if you want to have uh, a, a yard that has a lot of wildlife in it. Um, and also this shows you just things that you can put on your window so that birds do not fly into your window. So these are just easy things that you can do um, to start thinking about creating a landscape, sustainable landscape for wildlife. So as I mentioned, removing invasive plants is, is really critical, such as ivy that will, as you see, grows up trees, which you certainly don't want to have done. This is pur purple loose shrift, which can really get out of control uh, in an area. And scotch broom, which we probably have all seen going across um, the hillsides here, even in the Eugene area. Uh, lots of scotch broom. Um, so these are all invasives that you really do not want in your, um, in your yard or area. And by getting rid of some of these invasives, you will be able to create more space for diversity. And that is the key, is diversity. Um, and then you can replace those invasive plants with um, habitat-friendly plants that will um, be much better for your, your yard. So one of the things you need to think about are the insects that you have and which are good insects and which ones may not be so good. And I've listed, listed some of the, the good insects here. The ladybird beetle or the ladybug beetle, which we all recognize here in this lower picture. Um, all of our many native bees, and we'll be talking more about them in a little bit. The green lacewings, there's a picture right here of a green lacewing. Butterflies, dragonflies, um, they're very good um, insects as well, and damsel um, bugs. What's, what's so good about the ladybugs as well as the lace, green lace wings is that both of them eat aphids, which um, you can find um, if you're, especially if you're growing vegetables, you can find aphids and these are really good beneficial uh, insects to have to help control some of those, those um, insects that you may not want. Um, and know what all the pollinators are. There are many different types of pollinators. We, we're all familiar with butterflies and hummingbirds and bees, but moss can also be uh, pollinators, flies, beetles, bats. They can all be um, pollinators. So know all the different types of pollinators and, and welcome them into your yard because they are all serving a purpose in your yard. So there are basically three elements that you need in order to sustain wildlife in your yard. Uh, one is to have shelter and habitat for that wildlife. And we'll talk more about that. To have food both in the summer and the winter, and also to have water sources. Retaining native habitat, that is pretty important um, because a lot of our bees, our native bees, 70% actually of Oregon's bees live in the ground. So you can see in this picture down here, um, bees will live in holes underground. Many of our Oregon bees do. So you want to keep some open, open soil so that bees can come and go out of the soil because that is a critical habitat for native bees in our area. By having layering also, 
like in this garden here where you have trees, you have shrubs, um, you have various layers. That also is very good to attract uh, wildlife into your yard. Also um, dead branches or snags. You can see some snags here in this picture. Um, birds will use these um, for homes, as you can see here that they will create cavities in those dead um, trees to live in. So it's really important to, to keep some of these things in your yard. We actually lost one of our Douglas um, firs in our yard. So we created a snag out of it. Um, and we're hoping that someone will move into it. It's fairly new, it's only a year or so old, but we're hoping that we will get some wildlife to, to live in it. Um, minimal fall cleanup is also important because a lot of the insects that you um, have in your yard might be living in some of that plant matter. So don't be too quick to clean your yards in the fall and leave some of that over the winter so that these insects can uh, live in your yards during that time period. Also creating nesting opportunities and materials. Evergreens uh, are, are critical places for wildlife. So having some sort of evergreen layer in your yard is important. Layering, as I mentioned before, like in this garden is, is important or having cavities like in this mason bee uh, house for mason bees to live in so that they have a habitat for the time when they're in your yard. Or keeping, as I said, grasses available in the winter time so that insects can live in that area during the winter months when um, maybe uh, places are hard for insects to find or for food for the insects. A year round water source is important as well here. And you wanna have it pretty uh, shallow. And it's good to have like in this picture down below a rock or something in it. So um, dragonflies or bees or birds can perch on there and drink the water. So you don't want it to be too deep for um, the insects so that they can perch on the rock or on the side or, or, or somewhere around the water source. And you want it again to be year round. So even in the winter time, you would want to have some water out there, maybe some sort of small um, fountain in our front yard. We have a, a small fountain that runs year round and it's, Nice to see the deer um, or uh, hummingbirds or other birds uh, come there and drink water out of it um, year round. So it's nice to have a source like that. And you wanna provide food for all types of wildlife, even, even the deer, as you can see in this picture up above here. Um, I, I have some plants in my front yard that uh, I leave for the deer to eat. Um, certainly not everything, but there are some things that I, I have in my front yard. My backyard is fenced, so they can't get into that, but the deer do have to eat, especially in the summertime. Um, their food sources are, are less, so they will come into neighborhoods to, to eat. Um, and they're the, Birds, obviously the young, it's critical for them to have food sources year round. And you wanna have food for specific insects as well. You want to have, um, these are of course for the monarch butterfly and milkweed is considered to be one of the most important food sources and uh, hosts for the monarch butterfly. This is the larval stage for the monarch. 
caterpillar. And then you can see the adult um, monarch butterfly down here below. Um, my husband and I had a chance a number of years ago when we were in Mexico to go to a site where all these monarch butterflies nest over the winter down there. And it was amazing to see millions, it seemed like, uh, of butterflies just nesting. And when we got there, it was early in the morning and they were still um, just hanging on to the trees and the leaves. And then as the weather warmed, all of a sudden they started flying and it was just an amazing sight to see thousands and thousands of monarch butterflies just flying through the air. Um, so if you have a chance, go down to Mexico and, and see that amazing phenomenon. We also want to create habitats for future generations of wildlife. Uh, one of the things I mentioned was that a lot of our bird populations are declining. And it's critical that birds need to fledge two to three generations in one season in order for them to increase their populations. So that means that they need a lot of food source during the summer month when all these birds are hatching. So it's important that birds uh, can hatch, can lay, hatch, and then the birds will leave the nest and then they can have more eggs so they can leave the nest again. Um, so the, the food source is what, is what makes having two to three generations in one summer uh, happen. So you'll want to make sure that you have the food in your yard to sustain those hungry mouths as you see in this picture up above so that we can help increase the bird populations that are starting to decline across the country. But it's not only birds, it's, it's ladybugs we want to you know, have create food for, um, bumblebees, et cetera. So let me walk through a few um, principles here that you can do in order to create a pollinator habitat in your own backyard. One of the, the first element is to plant a diversity of flowers, shapes, and species. And what I mean by that is flower shapes as planting tubular flowers or uh, flat flowers like these daisies. Um, so have a wide diversity of shapes in your yard of flowers. Uh, and we'll talk about why that's important to various insects later on. And a lot of variety of, of flower species. And you can see in this lower picture how many different types of flowers you have in a fairly small area. That will attract the, the pollinators to your yard. And you also want to ensure that you have continuous flowering from early spring to fall. So think about when you're planting things, what will flower in the spring? What will flower in the summer? And what might fall, flower in the fall? Um, because there are certain perennials that will flower in each of those seasons. And do some research about that. So you will have a continuous flowering of plants in your yard throughout the season. Uh, so that pollinators will have enough food to stay in your yard throughout that whole time period. And think about including some natives. They don't all have to be natives. You can have some non-natives as well, but include some natives in your yard. And we'll talk about what some of those can be. Plant single flowered varieties. Um, that's important because um, I think we all are familiar with these double flowers. Single flowers um, are more like this, where you have a source of, of nectar in the middle. If you have double flowers, um, those flowers where basically all of this area is taken up by petals, 
they can be sterile and have no pollen in them. Uh, so there are no benefit to pollinators. So you really need to think about having uh, single flowered varieties, planting those in your yard because they are uh, more important for the pollinators. Plant larger blocks of pollinator flowers like these, this picture right here and include some bulbs and shrubs and trees uh, as well in there. Um, things that are closer to, to natives will increase, native plants will increase the pollinator visits. So that's why I mentioned to include some natives in your yard. But diversity is key. So the more variety of plants you have, the better. A couple more uh, principles, extend the bloom time by deadheading your flowers. So as you see in this lower picture here, if you deadhead some of these um, dead flowers here, you will actually add to the extent of time that that plant will flower. So um, it takes a little bit of effort, but I actually enjoy deadheading my flowers and uh, it will extend the time period that that particular plant will flower. So if you, if you leave um, these on, it will start to set seed and you would prefer not to do that while the plant is still flowering. And create nesting opportunities for bees, like cavities, as we talked about for mason bees, uh, bare soil, hollow twigs, all of those are important. Uh, for bees so that they have a nesting area in your yard. And if you are um, managing bees, and I know some people out there do, um, just make sure you get trained and how to control the diseases that might impact uh, your bee boxes so that you do not get um, diseases in, in your um, set of bees. And finally, um, eliminate or reduce the amount of pesticide use that you have, uh, that you use in your yard. You can also use annuals. Um, annuals will also provide nectar. So that's another source that you can plant if, to uh, take you a little bit of extra time to get perennials in. So you could put some annuals in, in the places of perennials. So let's talk about some examples of some of the nectar plants for um, butterflies. In, in the North America, there are 700 species of butterflies. And here in Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest, we have 20 species of butterflies. This is, this picture here is the Western tiger swallowtail. This one is the uh, painted lady. And down below here is the red admiral. So all of these um, have different areas uh, or different plants that they are interested in getting nectar from. But this list here are ones that um, are most butterflies will, will like. And the type of flowers that butterflies particularly like are large, showy, uh, pink, orange, purple generally. Uh, and they're flat like this one here, like it has a landing pad as we describe it so that the butterfly can land on the top of the flower. Uh, that's one that they really like or down below or else the stacked ones like this one, which is the lilac. Um, those are type, some of the types of flowers that they like. They also like fragrant flowers, the butterflies do. So anything that's sweetly scented, they will be attracted to. So the lilacs um, particularly would be something that they would really, really like. Um, but penstemons, Agastache, goldenrod, daisies, asters, milkweed, of course, for the monarchs. Um, those are all plants that you can plant in your yard that will attract 
uh, butterflies because they will come in, be coming to your yard for the nectar that those plants have. Um, the painted lady, for example, is particularly attracted to coneflowers and asters and zinnias. And the uh, Western tiger swallowtail is attracted to the lilac, as you can see here, and lavender. So um, just pick some examples of some of these and, and plant them in your yard and, and see what, what comes to your yard. I, every year, I enjoy looking to see which butterflies will arrive in my yard because they are so wonderful to watch. Hummingbirds, I think we all love to watch hummingbirds. And these are some nectar plants um, for hummingbirds. Now for hummingbirds, there are 340 species of hummingbirds in the world. And here in Oregon, we have five different species of hummingbirds. And really only two that are in our area. Uh, there's one that's in the coastal area, which is the Allen's hummingbird. Uh, here in Western Oregon, we have the Anna's hummingbird. And we also, a hummingbird, one of the hummingbirds that's all over Oregon is called the Rufus hummingbird. Uh, so the Anna's and the Rufus are ones that we will see here most commonly uh, in the Eugene area. But Eastern Oregon also has the black chinned, uh, hummingbird, but these are some of the flowers that you can plant in your yard for Pacific Northwest hummingbirds that will attract them. I know in my yard, I have a Crocosmia, and they just love, that's this flower right here, and you can see the hummingbird's beak just going deep into that tubular flower. And that is um, the type of flower that they really like, are colorful flowers with long tubes, like uh, here or up here. These both have long tubes of flowers that they can put their long beak into to get the nectar. Red flowers, they seem to be attracted to, but um, not only, not only red. But these are some examples, columbine, percosmia, bleeding heart, coral bells, cardinal flower, penstemon, fuchsias, and the red flower and currant, which are flowering right now in my yard. And um, I just saw a number of hummingbirds on there earlier today on my red flower and currants. Uh, so, um, they are all good species to, to plant in your yard to attract hummingbirds. Now let's talk a little bit about bees. Um, in Oregon, we have a huge variety of bees. There are actually over 800 species of bees, native bees in Oregon. The honeybee is actually not native um, to Oregon, it's, it's native to Europe. So it's an introduced species here, um, but our native bees uh, are ones that we are, that have, we've seen some declining declines in the population due to loss of habitat and also increase in pesticide use. So these are some of the plants that you can plant in your yard to attract some of our native bees such as um, the bumblebees or the mason bees or the sweat bees or the carpenter bees. There are so many different varieties of bees. Um, I have in my yard, I have ceanothus. I have several um, large ceanothus in my yard. And in, when they are blooming, uh, the bees are just covering those shrubs. Uh, and it, I, one day I remember standing there trying to count how many different types of bees I saw there um, because there was a wide variety. It wasn't just a bumblebee or it wasn't just a mason bee, but 
um, all sizes, shapes uh, of bees. So um, again, plant some of these in your yard. Russian sage is a, a great one. The Oregon grape, um, golden rods, the stone crops, the sedums will also attract bees, lupins. Those will be ripening soon uh, in my yard, the lupins. So um, those are all plants that you can plant. And bees are, are generally, um, they say they're attracted to yellow or blue violet, um, blue or lavender flowers, but, um, and I guess a lot of these actually are those colors. A lot of them are yellow and purple. Um, the ceanothus is blue. So uh, they do seem to be attracted more to yellows, blues, and, and lavenders. But uh, we want to try and keep our native bees here in Oregon. So uh, plant some of these to attract them to your, to your yard. And as I said, use, use of uh, pesticides is, uh, has been a problem in causing many of our native bee populations, bird populations to um, decline. So we wanna think about minimizing the use of pesticides in our yards uh, because pollinators can be very susceptible to pesticides. And if we need to, uh, we need want to make sure that we follow the instructions on the label when we're using them. Make sure you read uh, thoroughly and completely the directions uh, before you um, start spraying. And try not to spray widely, but to spray on a particular source that you want to get rid of, but definitely minimize the use of pesticides in your yard because they can, they can get into the uh, food and water of these pollinators. And you remember the picture of those birds with their hungry mouths, that food that's been uh, sprayed by pesticides can get into their mouths. And we certainly don't want that to happen. So beyond flowers, there are other things that you can think about to put in your yard. Fruit trees um, are, are one source. Uh, there are pictures here of Oregon crab apples or matrone. Um, in my yard, I have uh, apple trees and um, they're just about ready. The flowers are just about ready to open. And I also have um, plum uh, and a uh, pear tree as well. So those are all good sources for, um, for birds as well, our, our fruit trees. And berries, of course, uh, these are some sources, sorts of berries that you can put in your yard, the Oregon grape is a native that, um, that you can plant in your yard. Uh, viburnums also have berries and they support caterpillars and pollinators. Um, blueberries as well. Those, those are all good sources for um, various wildlife. I know when our blueberries get ripe, it's it's uh, hard to uh, keep the birds away. So we share our crop with the birds. Uh, I think they get half and we get half. We tried to net them one year, but um, I, one of, I, when I went out there once, I found a bird trapped inside the, the netting. So after that, I decided not to do that and just to uh, share, share it with the birds. So. Uh, I'm fine with that. They, they need their food sources too. Nuts are another example. Some of these trees are pretty big to plant in a yard, but you may have a larger property where you can plant uh, Oregon white oaks or hazelnuts or black cherries um, for the acorns. 
So those are all good sources too for um, birds and uh, wildlife so that they can eat the, the acorns from those trees. And seeds. Um, after, after all of these flowers have gone to seed at the end of the time when they're no longer producing flowers, let them go to seed at that point. And then the birds will love eating those seeds. I uh, usually let, I have rudbeckia, I have fairly large um, area of my yard that has rudbeckias in them. And I let those go to seed and I can see the birds just eating those seeds. So I let them stay up for the fall into the winter so that the birds can eat some of those, those seeds. And these are other examples of plants that you can leave up and um, Oregon sunshine. This is goldenrod, some aster here. All of those uh, are good for seeds. So leave those up in the winter for, as a food source for um, the birds. So uh, if you following, if you will follow all the steps that I've talked about, you should have success in have bringing wildlife into your yard. Um, as you can see here in the pictures, the hummingbirds, the butterflies and the bees, you should be able to attract all of them into your yard by following some of those steps, by creating some of those principles for a pollinator, uh, habitat for creating a pollinator habitat. And there are some human benefits as well by creating uh, drought resistance. A lot of our native plants are, are drought tolerant. We can conserve water by minimizing the use of pesticides. We can reduce the costs because we don't have to buy all those chemicals. Uh, we can reduce maintenance time, perhaps, by not eliminating everything all at once at the end of the season, but by leaving some of that up, uh, the plants up during those winter months. And children will love coming to your yard to see all the wildlife that you're attracting, the butterflies, the frogs, perhaps, the the hummingbirds, and they will all provide a natural beauty that you will love to see and cherish as you walk in, out into your yard. And once you've started attracting uh, wildlife to your own yard, you can share that experience with your neighbors because actually by building larger swaths of pollinator friendly landscapes, you will probably bring in more wildlife because the birds and the pollinators, when they see that color and a large uh, diversity of color and plants below them, that will attract them. So by connecting with your neighbors and having them grow similar plants or other plants, that will increase actually the amount of pollinators and wildlife that you will get into your yards. So here are some publications. These are some that I used uh, in this talk. And I think uh, some of these will go up onto the, um, in the chat, but these are all great OSU extension publications that, um, just by putting in the number in that uh, link up above the catalog extension in Oregon State, you can uh, pull up these, these, um, these publications. And in, for example, attract hummingbirds to your garden, it will give you very specific uh, plants and um, characteristics of plants that, that hummingbirds like, and the same with the butterflies. It will give you um, butterfly species and um, when they are active, and then which type of plants are host plants and nectar plants. 
So uh, I've only included a few of them in um, my talk, but there are many more that you can um, look at in some of these publications. So I encourage you to add, uh, to write these numbers down or, or look at the links and uh, look further into some of this research. And if you're interested in the bees, uh, this nurturing mason bees is a great resource as well. Uh, this first one, um, in enhancing urban and suburban landscapes to protect pollinators, this has the 10 principles of um, bringing, creating pollinator habitats to your yard. So if you're interested in that, it lays it all out there very succinctly and gives you lots of examples as well of those 10 principles, plus a lot of other information as well. So um, I think that's my last slide. This is uh, our Master Gardener Extension hotline. And um, I'll leave the second slide, I guess, up so people can write down those numbers if they didn't get them. But I guess we're open for questions. Should I yeah. leave, my, leave this up or should I stop share? Uh, you can leave it up for a while. I think that might be nice that people can write some of those down. So if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box. Um, I apologize because apparently um, I cut off the questioning a little early for the last group, but maybe um, you can answer it, Juliet, or if Catherine, oh. <laughs> if Catherine or Joanna is still on, maybe they can help out. Is there a best strategy for filling a raised bed? Do you know, or is Catherine? Oh, for filling a raised bed with soil? Yeah, we're here though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you want to take that? Okay. Oh, you just, uh, we're going to put our video on so we won't be disembodied. Can you, can you see us? No. Yeah, no. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, we can't see ourselves. Yeah. For filling a raised bed, um, actually, I rebuilt all of my raised beds this year. And um, I reused, of course, some of what was already in there. But I did get uh, some planting medium from Lane Forest Products delivered, which was uh, very dear because living in Cottage Grove, um, they have a $60 delivery oh, wow. fee. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, we did that, but I also have quite a bit of compost that I could put in there. And um, so that's generally what I add in there rather than maybe uh, well, maybe if you have access to some of your soil that you have around, but um, anyway, if that answered it somewhat of your question. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Oh, well, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, Julia, here's some questions for you. Okay. Can, can bees use the holes made by voles or do they just get routed from their burrows? I would think not. I would think that um, they, they need very tiny little holes that they would use and that they create themselves. Um, so uh, that's why I suggested leaving open those uh, bare soil so that they can create those holes themselves um, in the ground. Great, thank you. Do the flowers you mentioned require full sun? Do they require good soil? And what about pH? Uh, many of them do, but not all of them. Um, for example, coral bells, I know I mentioned that, that, that you can do in shade. Um, but a lot of the ones I mentioned, the uh, agastache can be part shade. So that one is part shade. Um, thinking if there are others that might, um, well, bleeding heart, certainly that's, that's a shade one as well, 
but many of them do, certainly the coneflowers, the, um, the echinacea, the yarrow, um, Russian sage, those all are pretty much full sun. And as far as soil, uh, I mean, I have clay soil here and I grow all of those in, in clay soil. Um, so they will, they will survive in pretty much anything, any type of soil. Okay. What about snakes, amphibians, and other types of wildlife? <laughs> Um, well, amphibians, I guess you would, you would need to have some sort of a, um, a water source for, for them. Um, so that's why having a, uh, water source is key. I know our, our next door neighbors actually have a small stream going through their, um, property and, uh, the frogs are just amazing, uh, in, in certain months. You can hear them chirping uh, all the time. And as far as, uh, I mean, I see garter snakes in my yard. And um, so, yeah, they, they're certainly attracted to uh, insects that you will find in your, in the, that will be in your yard. They will be attracted to those. Okay, um, that's all the questions I have so far. We'll give people a couple more seconds and I'll mention that um, um, to please fill out the, uh, the evaluation for this class. Um, the link to it is in the uh, chat and also um, Jet put in the chat all the links to the publications that um, Juliet mentioned. So if you look in there, you'll find um, the links to them. So, well, looks like we're done with questions for the evening. Thank you very much, uh, Juliet, and to both uh, Joanne and Catherine for their great presentations tonight. There are a lot of thank yous and great presentation notations in the chat. So I thought you'd like to know that. And thank you to everyone who attend attended the Sustainable Landscaping webinar tonight and uh, on the last two Mondays that we've had this class. We hope you learned from and enjoyed each of the sessions. Um, let me look one more time here. Yep, just another thanks in the Q&A. So have a great evening, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>